Lovely. So some of what I'm going to say this morning is for those who would consider themselves part of the church family here at St. Peter's. So if you're a guest or a visitor, it's really good having you with us. Thank you for coming. You're very welcome. Please ignore some of what I'm saying in terms of the direct application of today's teaching because it applies to St. Peter's. But um, the principles that I'll be talking about will apply to churches that you guys go to or other charitable stuff you give to. At the end of my talk, I'm going to ask the following. Firstly, I'm going to ask members of our church family who are new to giving money away. So this is a new thing for you. It's not something you're used to. You've never been in a context where you've been asked to give money to charitable causes or to your church. If you're new, I'm going to ask that you um, pray at the end and ask God about giving regularly to the work at St. Peter's. So that's first category. Second category, I'm going to ask those of us who are a part of the church family here at St. Peter's and are already giving regularly to the church. I'm going to ask you at the end to pray about upping that giving so that you're giving 10%. Obviously, you'll be giving to other charities as well, so take that into account, but that you up it so that you're giving 10%. And then finally, final group, I want to ask those of our church family who are already giving 10% to this church and to other charitable causes to ask the Holy Spirit and to pray about giving a one-off gift today for the work of the church here at St. Peter's. Couple of caveats to that. First caveat is I don't believe in the Old Testament tithe, okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So the 10% is there. I'll talk about that in a bit. Don't panic though. I'm not bringing us back to the law in the Old Testament. Second caveat, as I've always said, already said, not all of your giving will be to St. Peter's. You'll be giving to other charitable things as well. So take that into account when I talk about giving. I won't keep mentioning it. Third caveat, if you are struggling financially right now, you have a situation in your life where it is incredibly difficult right now now it's an emergency situation. We have a fund here called the Fellowship Fund at St. Peter's. We would love you to apply. All you need to do is email, and I'll give you the email in a second. Email, outline your circumstances, say what your financial need is, and we have a panel um, that won't it be, um, you, they won't know who you are, but it's a panel, it's anonymous, give them to the panel, and then we'll consider that, and then we'll give you money if we can. And then final caveat, if you are in spiraling debt right now, ignore the application of what I'm about to say. If you're in debt where it feels like interest is compounding on interest, you found yourself in trouble, please don't respond to this talk. Instead, I would love you to come and see me afterwards or email the email I'm about to give you. And we are partnering with a church in Broccoli called Grace Church in Broccoli, and they're going to be running a debt center, which lots of different churches are partnering with in the local area, and it helps people get out of terrible debt. So we want to partner with those guys and connect you in so that you can find help in that way. The email you will need if you want to apply to the Fellowship Fund, if you're struggling, is Andy C at stpetersbroccoli.org.uk. So Andy C at stpetersbroccoli.org.uk. He will be the only one that sees your email and then he will uh, forward it on anonymously. He also knows about the cat. Uh, cap job uh, debt center that we're partnering with here in Broccoli, so email him. But before I do any of that and talk more about those asks, I just want to do a bit of teaching on Jesus and money. And here's the point. If we want to be like Jesus, if we, this is what this whole series is about, it's being like Jesus, it's helping other people do the same. If we want to be like Jesus, we have to deal with our problem with money. If we want to be like Jesus, we have to deal with our problem with money. Jesus talked about money more than anything else. Have you heard that said in church before? People love making a big fuss about this. They say, Jesus taught it. In fact, in most churches you go to when they talk about this, you think, Jesus is obsessed with money. All he ever does is he talks about money. It's like, why is he talking about money? He really doesn't talk about money more than anything else. Let me give you an example. So people often quote this. They say, 11 out of the 39 parables, Jesus mentions money. And they go, he's obsessed with money. He's all about money. Money's a big issue in our life. That's not true. 18 out of those parables, he talks about food. But we don't talk about food much, do we? No, it's because it's not the point of the parables. It's not actually the purpose of what he's trying to teach. It just mentions money. So people make a big deal of it, and they look at their concordance, and they see all the times it mentions money, and say, well, Jesus must be obsessed with money. Jesus is not obsessed with money. Let me tell you what Jesus is obsessed with. Jesus is obsessed with the kingdom of God. As you read the teachings in the New Testament, all you'll find out is he's obsessed with the kingdom of God. And sometimes money gets in the way of that, so he talks about money a bit too. Let me just undermine a little bit 
of our common misconceptions with the gospel, biblical narrative, okay? So heaven and earth were never meant to be two, pla- uh, two separate places, okay? So Garden of Eden, you've got heaven and earth there in Genesis, okay? So this is the common teaching that we teach people in church, not in this church, but in some churches, or you may have been to churches where we teach this kind of thing. Um, obviously, you've got the fall where heaven leaves earth, it goes out, and you're left with earth there. Here we are spinning around on earth, all of us here now, okay? And at some point in our life, we're going to be confronted with the person of Jesus. If we say yes to the person of Jesus, we're going to go to heaven. If we say no to the person of Jesus, we're going to go to hell, okay? That's the common teaching in the Christian church. You'll hear lots of people talk about it. They might fluff it up in lots of different ways, but that's often really what they're saying. Now, How many times, let's have a little shout out, a little guess. How many times do you think heaven and hell are mentioned in the same context in the Bible? Heaven and hell as counterparts in the same context. Any guesses? You're allowed to be wrong. Oh, lao, lao. Zero, zero times heaven and hell mentioned as counterparts in the same context, okay? Let me tell you what the biblical narrative actually is. So here's heaven and earth. Genesis 1, never meant to be two separate places. The fall did indeed separate heaven and earth. So in earth, we did not experience what Adam and Eve were experiencing there in Genesis 1. Here's what happened. I love a good Venn diagram. Here's what happened when Jesus came. Okay? Jesus made it possible for heaven, thanks Charlie, heaven and earth to become one and the same place again, to return to back to how things were always originally meant to be. This is what's happening in Revelation 21, when he starts talking about a new heaven and a new earth, heaven descending on earth and making all things new. That making all things new isn't doing away with earth and then having heaven and hell. That all things new is what's existing becomes whole again. Everything that we were enjoying before in the garden, even before the fall of humankind, comes back together because of the person of Jesus. Now, this is the period we're in right now. Our job is to participate with Jesus in bringing earth and heaven back together again. That's our job. That's the whole point. We're trying to return things here in the power of the Holy Spirit, bring heaven and earth back to. So where's hell in all of this? Because the Bible does mention hell. Now, here's the point about hell. Let me get red for this, because it's angry. Here's hell. It is possible to experience Oh, gosh, that's heaven. Didn't want that. Oh, golly. (laughs) No! That's not what we want. Here's earth. It is possible to experience hell as a present-day reality on earth. And the whole point of the gospel... The whole point of Jesus being obsessed with the kingdom of God is he is imploring us. He's trying to us to realize who we are, carriers of the power and the presence of God, so that we can bring heaven on earth. And what does that do? It gets the hell out of earth. That's why this narrative of the Bible is so short-sighted. It is not the actual narrative that we find in the Bible. This is what it's about. This is the gospel. This is why, as a church, it's not just about trying to get everybody to make a decision. It's about discipling people so they realize who they are because of what Jesus has done so that we can bring heaven and earth back together again. Does that make sense? Okay, good. That's context for Jesus' teaching on money. You may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with money? Jesus did talk quite a bit about money. Here's the point. The love of money, love of money, not just money, the love of money, the love of money causes a lot of people to experience hell on earth. Causes us to experience hell on earth if we love money, and it causes other people to experience hell on earth because our love of money means that they experience hell. I'll explain more about that in a second. So, what is our problem with money according to Jesus? Well, according to Jesus, the first problem we have with money, you might not have a problem, but I'm just saying we because I do, so it kind of includes us all. The first problem we have with money is we don't know we have a problem with money. Problem number one with money is we have no idea we have a problem often. We have no idea we have a problem. What do I mean by that? Verse 22, 23. Jesus has this funny little illustration. It's sandwiched in between this teaching on money. It says this, the eye, verse 22, the eye is the lamp. 
Charlie, can we get it on screen? Is that possible? Sorry, I didn't prep you for that. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Seems a bit disconnected to the teaching on money either side. A little illustration that Jesus shares. What's he actually saying here? He's actually saying that money has the potential to blind us to the fact that we have a problem with it. Most of us have a problem with money and we don't even know it. We're blind to it. We're walking around, fumbling around in the dark, bumping into different things, crashing into different things, experiencing hell on earth ourselves, causing other people to experience hell on earth. Why? Because we have a love of money. We've got a problem with money and we don't even know about it. He spells it out more explicitly in Luke. Luke 11 and 12, he talks about money again and he uses this same illustration of the eye. If the eye isn't working, then your whole body is full of darkness. Exactly the same illustration. And then he says at the end in chapter 5, Chapter 12, so he says, watch out for greed. Watch out for greed. Now, Jesus doesn't need to tell us to watch out for sins that we know we're doing, right? So if you're murdering someone, and you're right in the middle of the act of murdering someone, then suddenly you go, oh, gosh, I'm murdering someone. It's not like we needed to be told to watch out to murder, not murder, right? But greed has this ability to blind ourselves to the fact that we have a problem with it, and so therefore Jesus says, watch out. Don't be deceived, about money. Something about money means we have a problem with it and we don't even know it. Let me give you some examples. These are examples from my own life. They might apply to you. We make stupid decisions when it comes to money. We might choose a job, for example. That, this isn't me, because I love my job. We might choose a job, for example, that we don't love, that we're not good at, that doesn't help other people. We choose a job purely on the basis that it makes us more money. Stupid decision. Doesn't make any sense at all. Other things. We buy things that we don't need, like an iPhone that is 0.1 millimeters thinner than the last iPhone, does exactly the same stuff, might have two lenses, might take better pictures, but you don't notice it because they look exactly the same, but we want it and it costs 500 pounds more and we try and get it. We make stupid decisions. Other things that we know, this, this money has this ability to blind us, we never think that we have enough of it. We always think if we just have that little bit more money, then we're going to be, we'll be fine, we're comfortable, we'll be secure, we'll be okay. If we just have that little bit more. There's always someone in our family or our friendship group who has more money than us. Other reasons money has this ability to blind us. We work for or we buy from companies that screw other people for profit. There's a brilliant example in the Anglican church. Do you remember when Justin Welwood came out and had a go at Wonga? Do you remember that? It's hilarious. So he comes out and he says, Wonga's wrong, which it is. It's awful. So Wonga will give money out, massive interest rates, and people get kind of burdened with crippling debt as a result of this kind of short-term money that they need. And Justin Welby rightly came out and said, that's ridiculous. That's awful. It's horrible. We need to come out against it. Then it turns out the Church of England were investing in Wonga. Now, do you think Justin Welby knew that? Of course he didn't know that. But there's someone in the department who's doing the investments at the church building who did know that. Do you think that person is kind of sat there rubbing his or her hands thinking, thank goodness we're screwing lots of poor people out of their livelihood and their lives as a result of the investment? No, of course they're not. What are they doing? They're blind to it. They're not even asking the questions anymore. They stop looking at the reality of what they're doing. Watch out for the love of money, Jesus says has this potential to sneak up on us. Smaller examples in our own lives. We buy clothes from places that use sweatshops. We do it all the time, don't we? Why? Because we think we can't afford the extra five pounds for something that's not made in a sweatshop. When giving money is mentioned, often we get a bit defensive, don't we? slightly a sign that we might have a problem with it. I, by the way, I'm not saying this to judge. I really do have all the same problems. I'm teaching, like, this is what Jesus says, and I'm teaching it to myself as much as anyone else, so please don't feel judged by me. So, Jesus talks a lot about money because I have a problem with money. The first problem we have with money is often we don't even know we have a problem with money. Second problem with money is that we have a habit of treating money like God. Verse 21 says this. This is two verses either side of that illustration that Jesus gives. Verse 21, for where our treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and you'll love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one, you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What is Jesus saying there? Well, he's using the language of worship to essentially make the point that money can be elevated to the position of a deity in our life. What does he mean by that? Well, look at the language he uses. For a start, he uses the Greek word mammon there for money, which some uh, scholars think that that is a direct kind of correlation to a Syrian god of the time, the god of uh, material possessions and greed and money. Um, But Look at, you don't even need to think that to, to realize that he's talking about worship here. Look at the language he uses. He uses the word of heart. Give your heart to money. What is the heart about? The heart is about our emotions. For the first century Jew, it was, about, it was the seat of our emotions, our sense of self-worth, our sense of happiness. We can give that power to money to, have, to determine how we feel in that way. He also uses the word serve. Now, in the Greek there, it's actually more severe. It means slave. We become slaves to money. In the same way we become a slave to God, and I'll talk more about that in a second, we can become a slave. To, what does that mean? It just means we make decisions based on money. Money has a hold of us so that we make decisions in order to be able to get more of it or sort it out in our lives. Other word he uses, he says, we can love money. We have this ability to love money. Now, the word love there is agape. There's lots of words of love. I talk this, about this a lot, right? Lots of words of love in ancient Greek. This word agape that he uses for love is sacrificial love. So what's he saying there? We make sacrifices all the time in order to get more money. We make sacrifices in order to satisfy this desire for money. Now, why is that a problem? And here's the point of this talk, really. Remember this. So, heaven and earth together, hell has the potential of being a present-day reality in our life right now. Here's the point. Every treasure but Jesus will insist that we experience hell in order to be able to purchase it. Every treasure but Jesus will insist that we experience hell in order to be able to purchase it. What do I mean? Well, think about it. If we give our heart, if we give our sense of self-worth, if we give our happiness to money or to possessions, then we are going to get our heart broken. It might, might not be straight away. It might be over time. It might be that at the beginning, it feels great. The more money coming in, you feel happier. You feel more worthy. You feel more significant. But over time, as the money builds, what you start to feel is absolutely worthless inside. How do I know that? I don't know that because I haven't had loads of money coming in. But lots of people who have had loads of money tell us that all of the time. It's everywhere. It's all they ever say. You get to a position where you always want more money. Even the people who really are rich, which is very few and far between, the people right at the top who have got it all, say they do not have happiness as a result of their money. It's never, ever enough. And so over time, if we give our heart to money, it breaks our heart. I think that's what Jesus is saying in verse 19 when he says, moth and vermin destroy, Right, So the way they used to store up money back in the day is they'd have loads of expensive garments and they'd store up loads of grain in barns and vermin used to get in and eat all of the grain and then moths used to get in and eat all of the garments. And that's not something that happens overnight. That's something that happens gradually over time, presumably. I mean, moths take a while to eat clothes, right? I think. I'm pretty sure. No. Okay, it's pretty quick. All right, fine. Didn't know that. Vermin must take some some mountain of wheat. Vermin probably takes a bit of time. Anyway, the point is, it happens. It's a gradual process. If we give our heart to money, at some point over time, we're going to get our heart broken. But also, sometimes it just happens instantly overnight. We all know someone or have had experiences in our own life where our security and money has just disappeared overnight. It's completely gone. That's what Jesus is saying there in verse 19, where it says thieves and robbers can take it in an instant, and it's gone. And so therefore, our heart is broken. 
How else do we worship money? Will we become a slave to money and possessions? And Jesus' point is, if we become a slave to money and possessions, then we'll never be free because it always demands more of us. It keeps us trapped in this cycle of greed. There's always a bigger house that we need to feel more secure, which comes along with it, a bigger mortgage, which requires a better job, which requires us to spend more time at work, which requires us to make more decisions based on money. We become a slave to it and it goes on and on and on and we never feel free and we're trapped in it. How else do we worship money? Jesus talks about this love of money, it's sacrificial love. We make sacrifices all the time so that we get money in return and the reality is Jesus says is we get nothing back because we know that by the end of life when we look back, if we have made all these sacrifices because of money, we look back and really the, the, the ultimate suffering when it comes to money and possessions, the ultimate hell on earth really is this existential crisis at the end where we look back and we say, what was all that time for? Why did I spend all of my time sacrificed on the altar of money and possessions? And meaning and purpose is left wanting. So, first problem with money. We don't know we have a problem with money, oftentimes. Second problem with money is we have a habit of treating money like God, and it breaks our heart. It causes us all sorts of problems. We experience hell on earth, as I've written up there. In uh, kind of, in the biblical narrative, we experience this hell on earth, and it breaks our heart. Sorry, I've just said that. Right. How do we deal with our problem of money? Hopefully, it'll take a turn now, because it's getting quite uncomfortable, isn't it? So, if every treasure but Jesus will experience, will require that we experience hell to purchase it, here is the beauty, the beauty of the gospel. Jesus is the only treasure who experienced hell so that we don't have to. So the gospel is that we can experience our heart's desire, that our happiness is in the person of Jesus, and it's bought with his blood, not with our suffering. The beauty of the gospel is that we can be a slave to him, that we can serve and obey Jesus, and he does not require us to experience hell as a result. The beauty of the gospel is that we can receive his ultimate sacrificial love so that we can feel at home in his presence. Jesus is the only treasure who experienced hell to purchase you and me. So how can we experience Jesus? Well, essentially, it's turning from worshipping the other stuff to turning to worshipping Jesus. It's really actually not that complicated. We often make it complicated. But if previously we were worshipping money, possessions, sub in anything. I mean, there's plenty of other things you could sub in there. The point at which things change and we experience Jesus instead is if we turn our back on that stuff and instead we choose to worship, we choose to give our heart, we choose to make sacrifices for, we choose to obey the person of Jesus, we put the person of Jesus at the center of our lives and then that stuff no longer has a hold or power over us as a result and instead we live our lives to Jesus. And we're loved unconditionally by him. And remember the eye illustration, right? So if you'll turn this way, if money and possessions has this ability to blind you, to blind us, so that we can't see a thing, we're bumping around in life, we're going left, right, and center, making an absolute hash of things. When you turn to see the person of Jesus, do you know what happens? The scales fall off our eyes, and suddenly we have clarity on everything in our life. We can see things clearly for the first time. Jesus says in that illustration, it's like light floods into our life, and everything makes sense. And the truth of it is, in order to be able to deal with this stuff in our life, the only solution is to encounter more of the person of Jesus, to give ourselves more in worship to Jesus, to constantly give him our heart, our emotions, to constantly say to him, we serve you, Jesus. We are truly willing to obey what it is that you're asking to do in life, to give our lives to him sacrificially in love in response to what he has already done. And the difference is we don't experience hell back. Instead, we experience the thing that we were created to experience right at the beginning of the Genesis narrative, the narrative of the whole Bible 
Bible. We are filled to overflowing with the power and the presence of the love of Jesus. And we come into relationship with him. And that void in our life that was previously unfulfilled by all the other stuff is filled by God. So back to money. If the solution is to give our lives more to the person of Jesus, to worship Jesus, how do we know if we've dealt with our problem with money? Well, verse 22 pretty much sums it up. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. That word healthy there. Now, I'm going to make a, I'm just going to admit something to you. Often what people do when they speak is they say, look, I know it says that in English, but in the Greek it actually means this, and it kind of supports the rest of their talk, and everyone goes, oh, that's very nice. Well, at least you've gone to theological college. They, it doesn't really matter anyway. The point is, when you look at your Bible, what you'll see is there's a little um, A or B. It's an A in my Bible next to the word healthy there. And if you cross it down, cross-reference, you look at the bottom, it says this. The Greek for healthy here, this is just so you know I'm not making this up to make the point of my talk. The Greek for healthy here implies generous. How do you know if your eyes are healthy? How do you know if you've dealt with your problem with money? Your eyes become generous. You start to look at situations around you. And you say, how can I bless? How can I give in this scenario? How can I be generous in this scenario? How can I make this more like heaven? How can I get the hell out of earth with what God has given me in the present? Generous for what reason? Verse 20, it says, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Heaven is not a place you go to when you die. Heaven can be experienced now. People are experiencing heaven and hell all around us. The victims of the violence in Israel and Palestine right now are experiencing hell. Hell is present on earth. It's our job as the people of God to bring his power and his presence into that situation and get the hell out to be peacemakers. Jerry prayed it. Blessed are the peacemakers. And here's the beautiful thing about Jesus' teaching on money in this context. Money, rather than having the potential to cause hell in our own life, rather than having the power and potential to cause hell in other people's lives... Money instead becomes an incredibly important resource in us seeing heaven and earth come back together again. In us dealing with people's experience of hell on earth. Rather than money use us, we get to use money to see heaven come. So, how can we do that at St. Peter's? Um, I told you I didn't believe in the 10% tithe. I don't believe in the 10% tithe. I think it's Old Testament law. Um, I think it's a bit lazy when churches say just work out 10% and give that. Um, I think it has the potential to become a bit legalistic. I can always tell when someone's heard this sort of teaching because their giving would be set up to church and it's like 104.32 pence, you know, and it comes in, you're like, you've clearly done that on a calculator and someone's talked to you about the time. I think we're not subject to the law. The point is we are people of the spirit. We are this side of what Jesus has done on the cross. We're this this side of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit within us. We can respond to the Spirit when it comes to giving money. The second reason I don't believe in the Old Testament tithe, and this is probably a little bit more punchy, is because I think 10% is nowhere near enough. Look at what Jesus did on the cross. Do you think he gave 10%? 10% is no... Look at the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus ends that sermon... By saying to everyone in front of him, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Do you think that is possible? No, it's impossible. Jesus is setting his hearers up for the cross and for the resurrection and for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The only way we are able to live the lives that Jesus calls us to live is if we understand the power of the cross, is if we understand the power of the resurrection, and if we're filled to overflowing on a daily basis of the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. It's an act of the Spirit. We are not responding to law here. This is not us coming under judgment about money. It is a, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way we can give money. 
The reality is the New Testament giving, uh, teaching on giving is way more sacrificial than 10%. If you read the Gospels in the New Testament, you'll realize that quite quick. Jesus demands everything of his followers. Acts, have you read Acts? Scary when you read Acts. It's pattern value, so it doesn't mean we have to do it exactly like Acts, but it kind of says something about the way they were following the Spirit then. It's pretty exciting when you read it. They start selling houses, by the way, for people who don't have any money. Um, when you read about Paul, Paul tells us to be hilarious givers. Do you know what a hilarious giver is? It's the kind of giver where someone who doesn't know Jesus looks at you and goes, you are a nut. You're off. Are you joking? You're hilarious. You're giving that much money. You're responding to Jesus in that kind of, It doesn't make any sense. Hilarious. It's like LOL givers. You've got to be LOL. I quite like that. Someone wants, What's the joke about LOL? Someone thought it was lots of love. Do you know that one? Like you get texts about someone's died and they, they send back LOL. And they thought it was lots of love, but it's laugh out loud. Anyway, we're supposed to be laugh out loud givers. People are supposed to laugh at us. To be like, these guys are idiots. They're a joke. That's only possible by the power of the Spirit. So back to what I'm asking of us this morning. Um, I'll say this really quickly. If you want more detail about this, please come and speak to me. Chris Harvey, do you want to put your hand up? Chris Harvey is our treasurer here. Thankfully, he does the numbers along with our accountant, Aaron. I don't do any numbers, so that puts all your hearts at rest because I have no idea what I'm doing with numbers. The church has grown over the last year, and the ministries we run have increased, but our giving has stayed the same. We've had some big givers leave London and stop giving. We've actually got more total givers giving to our church, but they're giving less, which is not a bad thing. probably says that we're attracting a crowd that's more local to Broccoli, which is a very good thing. But it does mean that as we look out into this next financial year, and we do it September to September, so September 2021 to August 2022, we're looking at a deficit of about 48k. So if we keep doing things as we are in church at the moment, with our current giving, we're going to be at the end of next year at a deficit of 48k. Now when you look at that deficit of 48k, it's almost exactly to the penny the amount that it's cost us to set up the food bank here at St. Peter's. So you remember I spoke about the food bank last two giving days, and we got a massive grant in to help. That grant was COVID specific, so it was only given during COVID times. It's not now available to us. And instead, we've got this 48K that we need to meet. That's probably about four grand. Now, this is where my maths come into play. Probably about four grand extra regular giving a month or three grand and some one-off gifts on this gift day. But we need to meet that. Now, we could go back and ask for more grants. We've tried at that place. They're not doing it anymore. But here's what I think. I think we are able to do this as a church. I think it's possible for us to do this, for not, us not to look for secular ways out of this. I think we can do this as a church family. I think we can raise the money to be able to run a food bank here. And the food bank, if you haven't been to it, is the most remarkable ministry that we run here at church. It is on fire. It's like coming into a church. The presence of God is thick when you come into this building during the food bank. It feeds over 200 people a week. Caroline and Phil and the team run this kindness team, and they're praying for people the whole time during the day. They're giving words to people. People have become Christians. We baptize people. You've seen us baptize people from the food bank. They're running a little church out the back whilst the food bank's happening happening. They're also doing lots of other things and meeting lots of other needs, not just food. And it's way more holistic than simply giving out food. In fact, it's actually called a social supermarket because people come in and they give money on the door, three pounds, like as a token. And then they go around and they can choose what they want. It is an absolutely brilliant ministry and it would be a crime for it to stop. As a leadership team, we thought about this when we looked at our coming budget. And we asked ourselves, because I think we have to ask this question, should we stop the food bank? Because that is the cost that's going to kill us in the next term. Um, We decided not to do that. On Monday, Lucy had a dream. She shared at a staff meeting Tuesday. She didn't know that I was going to be speaking about giving this Sunday. And in her dream, we're at a dinner party, me, Hanel, Lucy, and others. And me and Hanel are distracted the whole time at this party. And Lucy is being distracted by other people. And she's constantly in her dreams. She's trying to tell me in her now about justice. She's trying to tell us that we need to focus on justice. And in her dream, she can hear herself constantly saying, it's like Amos 5. It's like Amos 5. And then she woke up. And then she had this thing that we don't tell any new Christians to do, ever. Never do it. She opened up her Bible to see, (laughs) and it landed on Amos 5. 
And if you know Amos 5, there's a really scary bit in it. Let me just read it. It says this, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. And in verse 24 it says, But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never-failing stream. In the context there, the prophet Amos, he's speaking into the nation of Israel at a time where there was huge hypocrisy. They were compromised morally, and they were compromised in terms of their giving to those who needed it most. But they were putting on a good show on Sunday. Now, I'm not saying we're doing that now in our church, but I'm saying there's always that temptation and potential. And I think it's really important as a church that we step up and that we give in response to what God has been doing through our food bank this year so that we don't fall into that trap of singing a good game, talking a good game, but not actually living it out with the rest of our lives. Let's shut our eyes. The kids will be crawling up the rules. Sorry. We'll do this really quick. Um, You can respond to this in the week. Don't shut your eyes, sorry. Why did I say that? That's ridiculous. I'm about to write something down. Um, What's our website? St. Peter's broccoli.org.uk forward slash give. This is the best way to give. All on the website, everything you need to know is on there. Here are the three categories. Again, I feel like the Spirit's asked me to say, I wouldn't normally do this at all. I hate doing this kind of thing because I don't like being this prescriptive. But if you consider yourselves a member of the family here at St. Peter's, can you pray about starting regular giving? If you're just visiting, you're just checking us out, totally ignore what I'm saying. But if you are a member of the church family, you'll know if you are. Um, Can you pray about setting up regular giving? If you already give regularly, can you pray about upping it to 10% and obviously take into account other charitable giving you're giving? If you are already giving 10% to us or other charities, can you pray about giving a one-off gift this week? Okay, let's shut our eyes this time now. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit. We only do this in response to the Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we are people of you. We don't follow law. I pray right now that anything that I have said that has caused people to feel judged, that that would fall away right now in the name of Jesus. But Lord, we choose now to step in and not be put off by the challenge before us, the challenge of your teaching, Jesus. In the Gospels, the challenge of the teaching of the church, that we give our whole lives to you in worship. So I'm going to leave some silence now, and why don't you just ask God how you should respond to today? Amen. So that website's there if you need it to be able to respond during the week when you get home. Don't forget, lots of different things going on this week. 
Um, if you have kids in the kids' group, would you mind going to collect them? That would be great. In fact, why don't you just go and do that now? Because I'm late. I'm always late. Sorry about that. Um, and thank you for joining us online. Really good to have you with us. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Don't forget everything, the, all the ways you can connect into the church are on the website. It's under the Join In tab. And there's lots of stuff happening this week. My personal favorite is fasting on Thursday and then praying at five. Come along to that. I'm always there for that one. Everyone else, thank you so much for coming. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.